one day, Jesus will return to bring about the end times. Most Christians today believe this will happen after a period known as the Tribulation, where there will be a one-world government led by the Antichrist. This figure will persecute the remaining Christians and unleash hell on earth. But after seven years, Jesus will return to establish his kingdom on earth. This view of the end times is assumed by many to be the only proper way to understand how Jesus' return will happen. But historically, this is not the only way theologians have interpreted what the Bible says. There is a more positive view of how things might play out. One where the Great Commission is successful, and Jesus returns not to fight the Antichrist, but to a world ready to call him king. This is called postmillennialism, and I believe it is more consistent with the words of Scripture. The future is much brighter than you realize. When it comes to eschatology, which is the study of the end times, the view that most Christians today hold to is called premillennialism. This is the idea that Christ will return before the millennial reign, mentioned in Revelations 20. Prior to this return, most premillennialists believe the Great Commission will fail, ushering in a seven-year tribulation where the Antichrist will persecute the church and rule a one-world government. But there are other approaches as well. Another view is called amillennialism. Amillennialists interpret the 1,000-year reign of Revelation 20 as a symbolic number, and it metaphorically refers to the age of the church. Jesus is not going to return physically to reign for 1,000 years before final judgment. He is currently reigning from heaven on this view, and will return to judge when he sees fit. The third view is called postmillennialism, and it is the most positive of the three views. Postmillennialism is similar to amillennialism in that it teaches the 1,000 year reign is a symbolic number and refers to the church age. Jesus isn't going to return to reign for a specific 1,000 years. He is currently reigning from heaven. As Greg Bonson said, if you're an amillennialist or postmillennialist, then you believe that the millennium started at Christ's first coming. The main difference is, is that postmillennialists believe the church age will slowly, but surely, be effective in converting the vast majority of those living on earth. Thus, when Christ returns, the overwhelming majority of people will already be willing to call him king. Jesus does not return to a world ruined by war and tribulation, but to a world that has been transformed by the church into a golden age, where most welcome him as our true king. Christ is currently reigning, but waiting to physically return until the Great Commission is successful. Postmillennialism has often been paired with forms of theonomy which is the idea we should apply the regulations of the Mosaic Law to contemporary civil government, because it is believed this will help usher in the post-millennialist era. But mere post-millennialism does not entail this. One can believe the gospel will transform the world through the Great Commission, without believing we have to use governmental powers to enforce biblical laws. Now, despite the way it seems in our culture, there is a lot of evidence for post-millennialism in the scriptures. As noted, Premillennialists believe Christ must return to earth to reign for 1,000 years. But there is only one place in the whole Bible that speaks of a 1,000 year reign, and it's in the most figurative and cryptic book. Additionally, the term thousand is often used in the Bible figuratively. For example, when Psalm 50 says God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, it is clearly figurative since God actually owns every hill. Deuteronomy 1.11 promises Israel will be a thousand times more numerous. Deuteronomy 7.9 says God is faithful for a thousand generations. Psalm 84.10 and Psalm 94 compare 1,000 to a day. Since God is outside of time, he literally does not have to wait a full day to experience a thousand years. Likewise in Revelation, which is highly figurative, a thousand years likely is a symbolic number for a long and glorious reign and a quantitative perfection. The passage is set up as a vision. And visions often contain metaphors. The first event is an angel coming down to bind Satan, which probably shouldn't be understood as something that will literally happen like in the vision. Elsewhere, this act is described as something that has already occurred and took place in a spiritual sense. Verses 4 to 6 speak of the saints reigning with Christ, which elsewhere is presented as a current spiritual reality. We have to remember Revelation contains a lot of visions, never suggest they are all given in some chronological order 
or are all meant to be literal. Premillennialists tend to pick and choose which parts of Revelation are literal and metaphorical. No one thinks a beast with seven heads and ten horns is literally going to come up out of the sea. So this passage is taken as metaphorical of some future Antichrist. But without a clear reason, the thousand-year reign is understood to be the literal 1,000 years that Christ has to be physically present for. Greg Bonson said, The book of Revelation is not read literally by anyone, and yet there is a particular school of thought, the dispensational school, whose approach to reading the book of Revelation has a lot of hypocrisy on its hands that needs to be washed clean. There is no clear methodology that premillennialists have established in order to know which parts of Revelation can be understood as literal and which cannot. When we look at other books of the Bible that are far less cryptic and figurative, the second coming is not spoken as of happening long before final judgment, but accompanying it. There is no reason to think that these two events are separated by 1,000 years. Let's remember what B.B. Warfield said. We must not permit ourselves to forget that there is a sense in which it is proper to permit our understanding of so obscure a portion of scripture to be affected by the clearer teaching of its more didactic parts. The order of investigation should be from the clearer to the more obscure. We should take the more clear parts of scripture first, like 1 Corinthians 15, and let them better help us understand the cryptic sections. And 1 Corinthians 15 seems to very much support the postmillennialist position. Postmillennialism teaches that Christ is currently reigning, not waiting to do so in the future. And Paul said, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every role and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Paul could not be more clear. Not only is Christ reigning as king over all, but he will continue to reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. This is essentially the message of postmillennialism, and Paul states it explicitly. Christ is reigning and will continue to until the kingdom gradually covers the whole earth. 1 Corinthians very much references Psalm 110, which is one of the passages from the Hebrew Bible most quoted in the New Testament. It says that the Messiah will sit at the right hand of God until all his enemies are but a footstool. He will roll in the midst of his enemies, and his people will not be forced to submit, but freely offer themselves. The postmillennialist message is the kingdom of God will cover the whole earth slowly as more people freely come to Christ. Psalm 2 is also a messianic passage the New Testament authors reference, which speaks of the Messiah getting the nations as his inheritance. Additionally, in Philippians 2 we read, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This strongly suggests Jesus has been exalted as King, and every knee will bow one day and profess Him as Lord. Acts 2 and 5 also speak of Christ being exalted on high, and already reigning as King. Romans 1 says Jesus was already declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of Holiness by His resurrection from the dead. Hebrews 2.9 says, He has been crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. And Jesus says in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Numerous texts speak of Christ's kingdom beginning during his ministry. That's something off in the distant future. As Greg Bonson said, We cannot maintain that the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has not yet been established on the earth. Kenneth Gentry said, The long-awaited kingdom prophesied in the Old Testament era was about to break forth in history. Would its effect be wholly internal, limited to small pockets of the faithful? Or would it exhibit itself in powerful victory, transforming the mass of men in salvation? whole cultures by righteousness, and national governments for justice. Thus, the implication is Christ's kingdom has begun. He will remain in his current position until he has brought all people to him, thus meaning all his enemies will be turned into saints. The passages do not imply Christ is waiting to reign, or waiting for the world to turn into an apocalyptic nightmare. It suggests he is king now, and working to advance his kingdom across the globe. 
once that is complete, and all authority and powers are subjugated, then death shall be destroyed, and the kingdom shall be delivered over to the Father. Until then, we should be carrying out the Great Commission, with the mentality it will be accomplished. A number of scholars note when Jesus gives the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he alludes to Daniel 7 about the prophecy of the Son of Man. Herman Ritterboss said, Matthew 28 is a clear reference to the prophecy in Daniel 7.14, not only as to the fact but in the words themselves. Daniel 7 is not about the second coming, it is a coronation text, when the Son of Man is given his dominion, and the New Testament authors taught this text was fulfilled in Christ's resurrection. It says that when the Son of Man comes before the Ancient of Days, he is given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. We see these lines referenced in Matthew 28. Jesus says that he has been given all authority, and he has the power to be with us until the end of the age. He also sends out the church to make disciples of all nations. But in the context of Daniel 7, we should expect that the Great Commission is meant to fulfill what is spoken in Daniel, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Kenneth Gentry says, This is precisely what the Great Commission expects, that all nations will be discipled under his universal authority, with the result that they will be baptized in the glorious name of the Triune God. So since the Great Commission is meant to be part of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 7, why wouldn't we expect it to be eventually successful and truly bring all people to serve Christ? That is what was prophesied when the Son of Man would come into his kingdom. And we see the same prediction in Psalm 2, Psalm 110, and 1 Corinthians 15. But some argue the kingdom has taken too long to spread over all the earth. After all, it's been 2,000 years, and there are still many people who do not proclaim Jesus as Lord. But within Scripture, we see that it was prophesied the kingdom would gradually grow. In Daniel 2, he interprets a dream of a statue, which represents the kingdoms of the world. Then a stone from heaven cut out by no human hand strikes its feet, and causes the statue to crumble. Then the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 44 says, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. This implies that when Christ would come into his kingdom, which happened at his first coming, he would establish a kingdom that would be like a mountain that would slowly cover the whole earth. Gentry says, In this imagery, we have both continuity over time and remarkable development. The stone grows to become a mountain. We also witness struggle and resistance. The stone eventually smashes the image. Finally, we rejoice in its fortunes. The image is thoroughly crushed. This gradual progress to victory against opposition is portrayed also in Daniel 7.26, where we witness victory as a result of many blows rather than of one. This process manifests progressive corporate sanctification in history. Similarly, we see Ezekiel prophesies that God promised to establish the kingdom, starting with what can be compared to the sprig from a lofty top of a cedar. Then he will nurture it until it becomes a cedar. Trees gradually grow, not instantly. Not only that, but he also says, Under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, and make high the low tree. Dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it. This passage implies all the world will acknowledge the God of Israel as king. In Ezekiel 47, we see redemptive water flowing forth from the altar in the temple. First the water slowly comes up to the ankles, then to the knees, the loins, and then into a river that no one could ford. The river goes out to the sea and makes it fresh, which again applies the kingdom of God will begin at the altar and gradually spread to cover the whole earth. Interestingly enough, Jesus may be suggesting he fulfilled this in John 7. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In the New Testament, we see other signs the kingdom will gradually grow over all the earth. Mark 4 says, With what can be compared the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, 
which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches, so that birds of the air can make nests in its shade. So Jesus says the kingdom will start small and slowly grow. In Matthew 13, Jesus compares the kingdom to leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, till it was all leavened. So eventually the kingdom will fill all the available space. 1 John 2.8 says, The darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. And as we noted, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ will reign until all enemies are under his feet, which implies a gradual process as the kingdom spreads. God often uses gradual processes. He gradually unfolded his word over a period of about 1400 years, from Moses to the New Testament. He took generations, beginning with Abraham, to build the nation of Israel. The Holy Spirit slowly sanctifies believers. God's method has often involved slow and gradual processes. So why would the spread of the kingdom be any different? Jesus also seems to suggest he will not return until the world is ready to accept him as king. He said in the Olivet Discourse, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations before the end could come. Matthew 23, 39 states, For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So until Israel was ready to call Jesus Lord, he will not return. But Paul tells us this has been delayed until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So once again, we have an indication Jesus will not return until the Great Commission is successful among the Jews and Gentiles. He will reign until all enemies are under his feet, and every knee bows, and every tongue confesses he is Lord. Thus we see in the less cryptic texts of Scripture clear indications that Christ is reigning, and his kingdom is meant to gradually spread over all the earth. Then the end will come. This is not a future of failure. This is a future where the Great Commission is successful. As Greg Bonson said, This is really what it means to be a post-millennialist. We believe in the Great Commission. We believe it is going to be fulfilled. Now, a common objection is the fact that in Revelation and the Olivet Discourse, we see that persecution and tribulation are supposed to happen just before the end. If the world is supposed to gradually become better, to the point that almost all the world declares Jesus as King, why are we to expect tribulation and persecution just before the end? The first thing to note is we've already covered many passages, which indicate a gradual growth of the kingdom, which show Jesus will be successful through his people. These verses cannot be overlooked in our understanding of eschatology. But what about the verses that speak of tribulation happening? To answer this, we need to appeal to the nature of prophecy in the Bible, which we covered in a separate video. But to briefly summarize, prophecies about the future are not fatalistic proclamations, but conditional on the proper response of the people. As texts like Jeremiah 18 indicate, if the people do not respond properly, God will change his mind and delay the fulfillment or only partially fulfill something. Notice also in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus ties the period of tribulation to the destruction of the temple, which took place in 70 AD. Jesus also said for the end to come, the gospel must be preached to all nations first. Since this was not completed in 70 AD, in line with the conditional nature of prophecy, Jesus has every right to delay part of the prophecy that spoke of his second coming, especially since he also told Israel he would not come again until they were ready to call him Lord. Not everything that needed to be accomplished was so by 70 AD. So the aspects of prophecy which spoke of tribulation can be pointed to as having been fulfilled with the tribulation that occurred in 70 AD. The Olivet Discourse directly links it with the destruction of the temple, which already happened. The rest of the aspects of prophecy have been delayed because the scriptures tell us the gospel needs to be preached to all nations. As for the book of Revelation, it is a very cryptic text which causes many to read the figurative language in a way that fits with their predictions for the future. There have been multiple attempts to claim they have found out who the beast is and know the events of Revelation are happening in their lifetime. But most scholars see John as sending a cryptic message to the churches of his time regarding Christian persecution of the first century. The number of the beast is best understood as a gematria for the name Neron Caesar in Hebrew, which was used to secretly speak of the emperor. The beast is said to have seven heads and ten horns, but Revelation 17.9 says they are representative of seven mountains or hills. 
Rome was said to be the city on seven hills. The Ten Horns likely refer to the ten procurator governors under Nero. The harlot is likely Jerusalem in the Jewish high priest. She is arrayed in Jewish priestly colors of scarlet, purple, and gold, with a gold cup in her hand and a tiara. She is called a harlot because Jerusalem was called God's wife and was unfaithful to the Messiah when he came. We will need to do a separate series to cover all this in more detail, but Revelation is most likely also describing the tribulation period, which occurred in 70 AD. Titus marched his army into Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and his soldiers sacrificed to pagan gods on the Temple Mount. Christians were persecuted by Rome and the Jewish authorities. Thus, the passages that spoke of a future tribulation were fulfilled. The rest has been delayed until the fullness of the Gentiles has been completed. So the recognition that prophecy can be partially fulfilled and delayed and a post-millennialist understanding of the future can make the most sense with all of the eschatological scriptures. It can account for the texts that speak of a future tribulation by noting this occurred in 70 AD, and it can account for the other passages which speak of a slow and gradual victory, which do not make sense with most premillennialist interpretations. Furthermore, Kenneth Gentry notes the post-millennialist view is consistent with a smaller future rebellion, since some texts speak of Satan being released after the millennial reign, which may indicate that after the whole world has been saved, another brief and small rebellion will occur just before the end. Another piece of data that supports post-millennialism is history itself. Many pre-millennialists argue that within the past few decades, there has been a falling away, which indicates we're close to the end times. But this is focusing on such a small span of time, it doesn't mean Christianity is doomed, especially since Christianity is still growing around the world. Christianity was in much more danger of going extinct in 69 AD, or 303 AD, or 732 AD. Historically, because of persecutions and conquests, Christianity's growth has been set back at times. No post-millennialist suggests the spread of the kingdom will not have challenges. But despite this, it still continues to gradually grow. Furthermore, not only has Christianity been growing for the past 2,000 years to become the world's largest religion, it is also responsible for much of the progress we've made in building a better world. Numerous historians note Christianity was crucial for the development of modern science, which in turn has given rise to so much technology and has improved so many lives. Noah J. Efron says, one cannot recount the history of modern science without acknowledging the crucial importance of Christianity. James Hannum said, Christian theology turned out to be uniquely suited to encouraging the study of the natural world, which was believed to be God's creation. So the teachings of Christianity were crucial for the development of modern science, which in turn has greatly improved the quality of living. Research has also indicated Christian missionary activity was crucial for the rise and spread of democracy, religious and civil liberties, mass education and mass printing, to not just Europeans but indigenous groups around the world as well as ending harmful practices like foot binding, female genital cutting, widow burning, and consummating marriage before the age of 12. Christianity has also helped increase literacy rates in and outside of Europe, advanced education, including mass female education, improve the quality of healthcare and hygiene habits, transform social values, foster more citizen empowerment and political stability. The historian Tom Holland notes that Christianity was essential for the spread of moral values and duties that we take for granted. Christianity gave rise to abolitionist movements, ended polygamous practices, infanticide in the Roman Empire, and old patriarchal norms. It taught the necessity to care for the poor and underprivileged, that husbands had to be devoted to their wives, and that women deserve rights because they were also the image of God. Humanism derives ultimately from the claims made in the Bible, that humans are made in God's image, that the Son died equally for everyone, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Repeatedly, like a great earthquake, Christianity has sent reverberations across the world. Postmillennialism teaches Christianity, especially Christian missionary activity, will make the world a better place. As the gospel spreads, Christ will slowly bring about a golden era, where the lives of all creatures will improve. We are seeing the beginning of this, which would not have happened without Christianity. History itself supports postmillennialism. So in reality, our goal should be continuing this work. Christ commanded us to take the gospel to all nations. But the recent rise in popularity of premillennialism 
directs our attention away from this command. Instead, Christians focus on trying to figure out who the Antichrist is, or the politics of the nation of Israel, or calculating fictional timelines of when the tribulation will begin. Premillennialism is not only an inferior interpretation of scripture, it has the potential to hinder the Great Commission by causing us to focus on things that will not happen. Some Christians even resort to wasting money on food supplies to survive the tribulation, instead of using that money to support missionary activity. Even if you disagree with postmillennialism, Christ still commanded you to have a postmillennialist attitude. Let's also not forget the Jews of Jesus' day were not expecting a Messiah to die for the sins of humanity. They wanted a conquering Messiah to subdue the Gentiles and elect them to rule the inhabitants of the world. Their desire was to subdue the world, not to be a light to the world as God wants. And because of this, most of them missed the Messiah when he came. And have not Christians fallen into a similar mentality? We don't want Jesus to slowly save the world. We want him to return now, subdue our enemies, and establish our 1,000 year reign over all the earth. But throughout history, this is not what God has desired or wants us to desire. God's goal has always been to save humanity and will delay the end as long as possible so salvation can spread to every heart. So since the scriptures tell us this is what God desires, why would we expect anything except a post-millennialist future? The omnipotent creator desires it. He promised it in scripture and wants to see it through to the end. Thus, this is the post-millennialist understanding of scripture. God entered into the cosmos to build his kingdom, starting in Eden. But the humans he elected fell away and were exiled. Then God raised up a new people through the seed of Abraham to be a light to the nations. But Israel could not fulfill the task alone. So God sent his son to be born of the line of David to become the king of Israel. And through him, the kingdom can now pick up where it left off in Eden, when the first priest failed. Now through Jesus, the priest king who succeeded, the kingdom can spread to every corner of the world as it was originally intended to. This is a slow and gradual process, but God is still working in the way he originally began when he called humanity to subdue the earth in Genesis 1. Now the sons of God creation has grown for have finally appeared, being made alive in Christ. And through him, we are now part of the process that will turn the whole earth into Eden. God's message throughout the Bible has not been one of defeat, but one of victory. So therefore, stop trying to calculate when Jesus will return. Stop worrying about the Antichrist. There are many Antichrists who have come and gone. Stop living as if the church is about to be defeated by the kingdom of Satan, and we are just supposed to wait for Christ to return and do the work for us. And start realizing, Christ has already established his kingdom through his resurrection. He is king now and calls us to take the Great Commission to all nations with the spirit of victory. Satan has been bound and heaven has invaded earth. You are now part of the restoration process for this world. When Christ gave the Great Commission, he knew what he was doing. If it was not supposed to work, he would have instituted a different plan. But he gave it, knowing it would be successful, because the Holy Spirit is leading us in victory. So act like it, and take the gospel to the whole world. Until all are put under his feet, the end will not come. So what are you waiting for?